I'm Lady Gaga. <laughs> it's my first time to use something like this. Okay. Uh, congratulations, it's a boy. Well, that must have been the very first sentence that I've heard, but of course, I wasn't conscious enough to understand what it meant. But I cried. <laughs> I cried. Now I realize if I had consciousness back then, I must have cried because someone had that authority to assign me a gender that I did not, it did not agree with. So I was assigned male at birth. It's in my birth certificates. It was eventually placed in my passport, and it's in all of my documents. So at this point in my life, I may be someone that you may refer to as a transgender woman. Well, in fact, I am proud to call myself a transgender woman or trans woman. Trans penile. This is a word that we came up with in the Philippines 10 years ago, and I was part of that um, group of transgender women who decided that maybe we should use a word to denote ourselves with. This is a picture of me and my mother. And um, I decided to choose this because I think it's a special photo to me because I felt that I was very happy at that moment. So I was embracing my mother's arms. But I don't know what my mother was thinking. If you look at her, she doesn't seem so happy at that point. <laughs> but uh, when I was looking at most of my mother's photos, that's kind of her default expression. So it was fine. <laughs> However, I also chose this photo because apparently a lot of my relatives would describe me in a certain way just by looking at this photo. So they'd say that, look at you, at that age, as a kid, you were already very feminine. Or sometimes they would use the word effeminate. Well, maybe they are true. Because indeed, as early as I could remember, when I was five or perhaps six, if that's the earliest I could recall, I never really saw myself as a boy. I never really identified myself as a boy. I identified myself as a girl. And I have the Justice League of America to thank for, for helping me realize that, particularly Wonder Woman. When the movie Wonder Woman was released last year, um, and it became like a huge uh, box office hit, and I think it was also a critic darling, I was very grateful that finally my childhood superhero is in the big screen. Because she was probably the second person that I ever identified myself with, the first being my mother. So my first dream as a child is to be a woman, just like my mother and just like Wonder Woman. I don't know the exact characteristics of Wonder Woman that made me feel inspired that that's what I want to be. But I think it's her strength, it's her intelligence, it's her powers, it's her independence, and it's her ability to you know, move alongside Batman and Superman and not be dictated on what to do. Fortunately, when we were playing role play games, you know, and um, Super Friends, or rather, the Justice League of America was among our favorite role play games to play, it would not be difficult for me to snag Wonder Woman as the character because most of my playmates then would be boys. It would eventually be a problem if my playmates were mostly girls because we would all fight over Wonder Woman. And the secondary character like Supergirl or Batgirl or Hawkgirl you know, would not be as popular a choice as Wonder Woman is. So I may have been five or six when I discovered my gender identity. But it took me about two years after that when I discovered my sexuality. You know, gender and sex or gender and sexuality are sometimes interchanged, but they are two distinct concepts. Well, they may affect one another, but they should not be interchanged. So I discovered I'm a girl when I was about five or six, but I discovered falling in love, or maybe no, uh, having my first crush when I was about seven or perhaps eight. And my first crush was Superman. <laughs> and I was old enough to actually witness 
um, Christopher Reeve, an American actor who played Superman in four movies. And he, it was a very iconic moment. I don't know what it was about him. Maybe it was his um, sturdy build, or maybe it was his superpowers or his X-ray vision, or maybe it's the idea of being beautiful and handsome that struck off to me in a certain way. Growing up, I was also trained to think of myself in certain ways that I think society has shaped us to think of ourselves as, like those qualities that we see on in this screen. Boys don't cry, or boys are not allowed to cry. So each and every time that I feel that I have to cry, I have to stop myself because everybody else around me labels me as a boy, even if, of course, to me, I know the difference. I always saw myself as a girl, and I think I have some creative juices inside of me that I could not nurture because society does not want me to identify myself as a girl. And I think I'm not the only one who suffered from this. Now, I don't know about you. How about you? How did you view yourselves growing up? How did others' views of you affect you? How did it shape you? Well, to me, it shaped me in certain ways. Some of which, good, some not so good. Is this how your brain <laughs> look like? Yeah, this is how society thinks of us. Or this. And I don't know if you'd like to agree with this or not. So maybe we can talk about that later on. But in the Philippines, I have seen different portrayals of gender variant and transgender people, even if we did not have the word transgender. When I was growing up in the 80s and in the 90s, I have not heard of the word transgender. I may have heard of the word transsexual once or twice, but I've only heard of the word bakla. Bakla in the Philippines is primarily um, translated as gay man or as a gay man. However, bakla also denotes the identities of trans women, queer men. So anyone assigned male at birth, I grew up watching on TV or in the movies. There was she-man based on the characters He-Man and She-Ra, who actually were twins. There is Barbie, who is also a trans woman, who ran for president. And then there's Pacifica Palaypay. It felt good seeing characters like them um, in the big screen. However, I think the problem was the label. I didn't identify as that label that they were given. Maybe I can talk about that again later on. And then came this character. She is Zsa Zsa Zaburna. She, I think, was our very first queer slash trans superhero or superheroine. Zsa Zsa starts as Ada or Ada. So that is her uh, human or layperson alter ego. When Ada has to answer the call of distress from around her, she swallows this huge stone and then mumbles uh, a chant and becomes this post-op transsexual superhero. Uh, I thought at that point it was really funny because maybe it's one way that my society in the Philippines view trans people and gay men, that we are actually a part of this umbrella of identities. For indeed, gay men and trans women and everybody else in between were conflated under that word, bakla. The opposite of bakla would be tomboy. So if you're a trans man or an FPM, if you're a queer man, if you're a lesbian, or if you're simply a boyish woman or a boyish girl, you'd be labeled as tomboy. I think I was around 10 or 11 when I saw my very first beauty pageant that is originally meant for trans women. But this pageant is labeled as Miss Gay. I would eventually end up watching many Miss Gay pageants from street to street every weekend. So in the Philippines, around 500 um, pageants like these would be staged across the country, well, most of which in Manila, where I grew up in. 
But this was a very important time in my life because it is at this point that I realized that, that there is someone like me who is now a grown-up. And I managed to ask a few of them the questions I've always wanted to ask. One, how were you identified um, by society? Two, how were you assigned at birth? Three, how do you see yourself now? And I'm very satisfied with their answers because their experience is similar as mine. Now the question is, will their struggles be similar with my struggles? So this is a blank um, um, page because I wanted to share with you a few of my experiences in between. Growing up in the Philippines, in the schools, um, we were not allowed to express our identities the way we want to. We were required to actually wear uniforms. So it's just a gender binary system that we follow. It's just male or female. So I was forced to wear the male uniform. I'm supposed to have a very short haircut and I'm only allowed to go to the boys' bathroom or toilet. And I cannot cross the other line or the other side because if I do, I get punished. That's how gender was enforced in the Philippines. But much later in my life, there were things that I found out. That in different parts of the world, many years ago, there were other people like me with different labels. Waria, Chalabai, Chalalai in Indonesia, Maknya in Malaysia, Katoy, Kao Prophet Sang in Thailand, Hijra in South Asia, Faakapine in the Samoas, and in North America, as early as the 1600s or the uh, 1500s or 1400s, there were Birdash or Two-Spirit people. In the Philippines, this is a part of our history that is not clearly stated in our history books. They were erased. The Babaylans, the Asogs, the Bayogs. When the Spanish arrived in the Philippines in 1521, they have in a way decimated any forms of gender variance and gender transgressions. But the Babaylans, in the day, they were highly venerated people in society. They did not exhibit the stereotypical masculinities and femininities that we can describe nowadays. They were always somewhere in between or beyond these boxes. But when the Spanish came, everything started with O and A, and everything ended with O and A. What do I mean by that? Our names were gendered. Mario, Maria. Pedro, Pedra. Angelo, Angela. Gendering was brought to us primarily during these colonial times, along with religion. And religion, has actually affected our identities in many ways, mostly in negative ways. Because religion has somehow pathologized our identities. They say that in the Bible, there's only a man and a woman. So you cannot be in love with someone of your same sex or same gender. But at the same time, they interpret that in ways that you cannot cross that gender because there's only a man and a woman. Fortunately, I became a researcher. And in researching, I learned that there are points in between and that gender is a spectrum. I learned that gender is a social construction. It's a cultural construction that we can shape the meaning of gender. And we are responsible for shaping our identities. But apparently, society is not able to recognize that. So if you have not yet seen this model, um, a comedian and a motivational speaker, Sam Kellerman, also appeared on the stage of TED many years ago, and I think he introduced the gender bread model. And there are several models out there that you can find. You have the gender unicorn, which is now going to be replaced by the gender elephant. But what are we using these models for? Well, to remind us that, one, we were assigned a certain sex at birth.
but that is just based on our biology. That does not dictate our gender identity. Our gender identity is invisible to everybody else. When I walk around the streets, you're not necessarily able to know that I identify as a woman unless I tell you. Because gender identity is my internal sense of being a man, a woman, someone in between, or beyond that gender system. There's also gender expression. Gender expression is how we manifest ourselves, how we present ourselves to the world, how we walk, how we talk, the pitch of our voice, how we dress, the color of our hair, everything that's gender expression. Maybe if you're also going to utilize other concepts like gender performativity, you can tie it in gender expression. Sexual orientation is not about our gender identity. Gender identity is who I get up in the morning as. I get up in the morning as a woman, and I sleep as a woman. So that is who I am 24-7. But sexual orientation is who I can potentially fall in love with, or who I want to have sex with. If I am oriented towards men, that does not identify me as a woman automatically. I'm simply attracted to men. But my gender identity is separate from that. There are trans women who are straight. I may be one of them. But there are trans women who are lesbians, who are asexual, who are pansexual. There are transgender men who are bisexual, who are straight, who are gay. So being a transgender woman is part of an umbrella of identities. And there are just many possibilities. In my case, originally I wanted to transition my body. Totally. What does transitioning mean? Transitioning means to move your body from one point to another. To move your identity from one point to another. But I realized I am not like other transgender people. I can only move some parts of my body and change it, redesign it. And then if I'm happy, that's it. And there are other trans women or transgender people who decide to do everything. So to be very honest with you, I have not done sex reassignment surgery because I don't want to. But I've done a few surgeries, you know, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's my choice. It's what I want for my body. Now there are other identities like bi-gendered and agendered people who may not care about doing this. I'm also grateful I discovered activism because with activism, I found my voice and I decided to share my voice in every platform I can find so I can be a voice of reason for others like me. There may be other children out there who don't know how to identify themselves, but if I get on the platform and speak about my experience, my experience might resonate to them and they may actually feel free to identify themselves. Unfortunately, I live in a society that's very harsh. And I think this is not only happening in the Philippines. It may be happening in Hong Kong in some ways we just don't hear about. It's happening in North America and Europe, in the most industrialized and in the most advanced societies. And one of the worst experiences I had was two years ago when I was blocked by the police from using the women's toilet. The police actually told me that my gender is my Hong Kong ID. So I should go to the male bathroom. And that was a very traumatizing experience. Because I realized that why is someone else dictating my reality? So I'm giving you this talk to remind you that you own your identity. You own who you are. And you should not allow someone else to decide for you. Thank you.